New Scotland Yard, synonymous with excellence in crime solving, recognised as a world leader in murder investigation. Every year, New Scotland Yard's experienced detectives unravel the twisted truth from the tragedies that unfold across the bustling capital city of London. Uncovering evidence that nails the guilty beyond all reasonable doubt takes time, dedication and a forensic attention to detail. This is New Scotland Yard Files. A shocking series of murders. Creating terror across South London. A serial killer on the loose, preying on the elderly. This is the story of the Stockwell Strangler. In the hot summer of 1986, the area around Stockwell in South London was recovering from serious riots that had occurred in neighbouring Brixton the previous year. Community relations were tense. Will you just listen to me? I'm asking you. Listen to me. But now local residents had to place their trust in New Scotland Yard detectives to find a terrifying serial killer who was hidden in their midst. Journalist Robin White covered the story from the beginning. In April 1986, police were called to a basement flat in South London, where they found the body of 78-year-old Nancy Ems. She had been strangled and sexually abused. I can remember 1986 particularly well because it was a really busy year. And for a start, we had prison riots going on all over the country. And then we had Patrick McGee and the trial of the Brighton bomber going on at the Old Bailey. And then suddenly we had this man, the Stockwell Strangler, roaming around the streets of South London, which was horrifying everybody. The victim was 78-year-old Nancy Ems, a retired schoolteacher who lived on her own. The first recorded murder by the so-called Stockwell Strangler was remarkable in two ways. Firstly, it didn't happen in Stockwell, but in the neighbouring borough of Wandsworth. And secondly, to the untrained eye, it didn't look like murder at all. Wensley Clarkson covered the killings for the Sunday Mirror. Nobody back then when Nancy Ems died had any idea that this was going to lead to one of the most awful serial killings that London's ever known. Like many elderly women, retired teacher Nancy lived on her own. Nancy Ems had dementia, lived alone in pretty squalid conditions. Occasionally a home help would come over to help her. She was plainly and obviously vulnerable. On April 9th, 1986, the home help arrived at Nancy's first floor flat in Wandsworth to find her dead. She was tucked up in bed, seemingly peaceful, but all was not as it seemed. Criminologist Davinda Curry specialises in the analysis of serial murderers. She had bruising on her chest that suggested there'd been pressure placed on her, and there would be marks around her neck to show that there'd been handprints around her neck. Despite this, the local doctor issued a death certificate saying she died of natural causes. I do struggle to understand how such a judgment could have been made because just a cursory examination of the body would have revealed that a serious sexual assault had taken place, violence had been used, pressure had been applied to the body. But when Nancy's care assistant returned to the flat to clean up, she noticed something that she totally overlooked earlier. Detective Sergeant Dave Bell was one of hundreds of New Scotland Yard officers drafted in to help catch the murderer. It was only sometime after her death that the home help realised that the television was missing 
and so that alerted the, the police that it may have been a crime scene. That led to a post-mortem, and then it was discovered that she'd uh, been strangled and murdered. Nancy's upper body was bruised, and her ribs were cracked from where the assailant had knelt on her frail body to strangle her, and she'd been sexually assaulted. The new Scotland Yard murder squad was called to her flat to start unpicking the crime scene. It would have been treated as a crime scene, so therefore it would have been the subject to a forensic strategy, which would include fingerprinting of the whole room and the whole flat. It, there would have been an inch by inch search of the whole flat, and as a result of that, they found a head hair on her bedding, which subsequently transpired to be an Afro-Caribbean head hair. So that was the first of the forensic clues Despite the gruesome nature of her death, Nancy Emsey's murder didn't make big news. Investigators had a man's hair, a useful clue, but this was the 1980s. DNA profiling was in its infancy and computerization of police records was only just starting. In those days, cross-referencing any evidence was a manual exercise and took a lot of valuable police time. You've got to remember that at that time, there was hardly any DNA, it was just starting. And of course also, very little had been uploaded onto computers. So in this particular investigation, we had detectives who were going through thousands and thousands of paper cards looking at suspects. The investigation team were looking at anybody who was a local burglar, anybody who had committed sexual assaults. It's very unusual to get a burglar and who is a sexual assault person. However, all that was being researched. So while there was no specific suspect, many suspects were being researched and looked at. The murder of Nancy Ems really didn't create much coverage in terms of the press and the media. It was an elderly lady. Uh, initially thought to be natural causes, and then it turns out that it wasn't. But even despite that, it still didn't get a lot of coverage. It's an unusual combination of offences. Burglary, rape and murder. And it didn't fit the form of any local villains. Throughout April and May 1986, the police were coming up empty-handed, and whoever was responsible was laying low. Detective Sergeant Dave Bell remembers South London in the 1980s as a very different place. Stockwell and Brixton were in 1986, run down pretty near the poverty line, lots of drug dealing, lots of petty crime and serious crime, and a lot of stabbings. Around about that time, there was also a lot of social unrest with the Brixton riots were around about that time. Wensley Clarkson also remembers the lingering effects of the recent social unrest in South London. There was a very delicate relationship between the police and the community in this area at that time because of the riots. Tensions didn't go away. In those days, Stockwell was really quite a run-down working-class area with a lot of council homes and a lot of assisted housing. Um, and also, quite a lot of old people's homes, council run and otherwise. Now, the nature of it was such that it's not a place where you would walk around late at night and feel safe. Then, exactly two months after Nancy Ems's murder, on June 9th, the killer struck again, and this time it was in Stockwell. 67-year-old pensioner Janet Cockett was a recent widow who led a busy life. A mother and grandmother, she was outgoing and active. She was the chair of her tenants association where she lived on the ground floor of her block of flats. She was found by a neighbor, and this time there was no doubt, it was murder. The second victim was a Miss Cockett. She lived on in a flat by herself. Entry was gained through an open window. She had been strangled, post-mortem, established that she'd been strangled by hand. She'd also had bruising on her chest, if not broken ribs, where it, the implication was that her killer had knelt on her chest to hold her down while stranding her. Janet was found naked 
but tucked up in her bed with her arms folded across her chest. Bizarrely, her nightdress was ripped but had been folded neatly and put on a chair. On arrival, police cordoned off the crime scene and began a fingertip search for clues around the flat, focusing on the bedroom where the horrifying crime had taken place. Forensic scientist Ann Davis attended the crime scene. She collected specimens to conduct tests at the Metropolitan Police Laboratory. As a forensic scientist, I would be one of the later people to the scene. He would have been thoroughly examined and fingerprinted probably by the, by the time I got there. And I remember the nightdress, the torn nightdress, which I believe be, belonged to Cockett. The, and, and spending ages with that nightdress, trying to ascertain that it had been torn rather than cut. So that was an oddity, that you would do that to somebody's clothing. Why, why would anybody do that? And there were other details, both peculiar and sinister, that left detectives puzzled. For some reason, family photographs had been covered with a cloth. Why would somebody cover the photographs up? And I gather in other cases, the photographs had been turned upside down. Fresh semen stains were found on Janet's bed, and that led Scotland Yard to explore what was then new territory in forensics. It was the first case that the Met attempted uh, DNA profiling on. Not very successfully, it was only a partial profile. Most importantly, the team find a clear palm print on the bathroom window. Detectives at New Scotland Yard now had vital forensic clues left by the killer. What you must recall is in 1986, it was just the start of all the computerization that nowadays can identify fingerprints and palm prints very quickly. And so it was a manual search back in those days. It's only of use to the investigation if the person to whom that palm print belongs has been arrested before and has their fingerprints and palm prints already on police record. If you go into Scotland Yard, as it used to be in those days, and go upstairs, there were people with file cards and computers and you know, piles and piles of pieces of paper trying to sift through and work out and work out what was going on. Even though the first two murders were just five miles apart, two different police stations were investigating. Officers spoke to each other, but they didn't initially link the deaths. However, the press had started to take an interest and they began making connections. The moment you get two murders, and two murders in the same area, then journalists really wake up. And that's when they start to put pressure on the police, and that's when they start to ask questions about, is this a serial killer? Serial killer isn't a term used lightly by detectives, but it would soon become the description of the multiple murderer New Scotland Yard were now dealing with. At 3 a.m. in the morning, on June 27th, 73-year-old pensioner Frederick Prentice was sound asleep. It was another hot night and his window was open. Then there was the third attack, a man called Fred Prentice, who was in his 70s and living in an old people's home in Clapham, was asleep in bed one night when suddenly he was woken up by a man who'd broken in and was starting to attack him. Suddenly he wakes up to find a man straddling him with his knees pressing into his chest, trying to strangle him and shouting, kill, kill, kill. It's a nightmare scenario. Bearing in mind, Mr. Prince is a very old man. We were strangling him with one hand, at the same time saying, kill, 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 and then shushing Mr. Prentice not to make a noise. There was a vicious struggle and Prentice managed to press the button, the alarm button that they had, which alerted people. Staff in the old people's home came running to Fred's aid. Disturbed, the attacker escapes out of the window and disappears into the night. Before making off, Fred's assailant flung him against the wall, knocking him unconscious. Fred later recounted his narrow escape from death. So this is what Mr Prentice said at the time. I was absolutely terrified, but there was nothing I could do. He was sitting on my chest with his fingers clutching at my neck. I thought I was a goner. I kept pleading with him to let me go. I suppose he thought he must have killed me because he ran out leaving me for dead. 
I was too frightened even to watch him go. I shall always have his face in my memory. His terrible grin. He ruined my life. Fred Prentice's horrific ordeal provides invaluable evidence to the police. It gives them their first description of the man who would go on to terrorise South London that summer. The fact that Mr Prentice lived was of great assistance to the investigation. Now we had a live witness. He was able to give a description which, whilst not 100% accurate, it certainly gave the investigation an idea as to who we were looking for. Age, sex, build, that sort of thing. Detectives at New Scotland Yard draw parallels between the manner of the attack on Fred Prentice and the earlier murders of Nancy Ems and Janet Cockett. Amongst themselves, they're beginning to theorise they may have a serial killer on their hands. To avoid premature panic, the Yard did not immediately divulge their suspicions to the public. Now, it's always difficult for police to talk about a serial killer, and they're very reluctant to do it because it causes widespread fear. But the reality was there was someone out there killing people with impunity, cold-bloodedly, and targeting them in exactly the way that all the big serial killers in America, who we knew about at the time, were doing the same thing. When a serial murderer is on the loose, police need to balance the need for information to help catch the killer with the need not to cause the public to panic. It's a delicate choice to get right. But just one day after the attack on Fred Prentice on June 28th, that decision was taken out of their hands. The killer struck again. The third and fourth murders happened in an old people's home, not far away, also in Stockwell. These were two men, two old age pensioners, both Polish. He broke in and murdered both of them in fairly rapid succession. The big news to Brava, 94, and Valentine Gleam, 84, lived in adjacent bedrooms in an old people's home in Stockwell. Their murders were brutal. Just like the two female victims, both men had bruised ribs where their attacker had knelt on their chests while he strangled them to death. Valentine Gleam had also been sexually assaulted. It was clear to police they had a monster to find. Certainly, I've dealt with many murders. I've dealt with many sexual assaults, but very, very rarely in tandem with a murder as well. But by the time the two Polish men had been killed, there was no doubt that we were looking for a serial killer. Valentine Gleam and Zbigniew Stabrava murdered in another old people's home, again with the same trademarks. Police knew they were after a maniac. We're looking for some sort of monster to break into a, an elderly person's home like this and strangle two people for apparently no reason. Um, some sort of madman, I would think. When it became apparent that these sexual assaults were taking place on the victims, both before they were dead and it strongly suspected that they were sexually assaulted after death as well, it had a profound effect. The victims were male and female. They'd been strangled and raped and placed in repose after their murder and assault. Police were starting to build a psychological profile from the signature details of the murders. The victims were all pensioners. The sexual aspect made police believe they could be seeking a gerontophile, someone sexually interested in the old. Sometimes he carries out these horrific sexual attacks, the rape, sometimes he doesn't. The indiscriminate quality of it reflects the way in which this is just a primal expression. There's some degree of gerontophilia here, but it's not the predominant psychological force going on. Much more potent is the predatory drive within him, is this animalistic, wild, untamed component. The gerontophilia just manifests as part of that because elderly victims are, on the whole, available and vulnerable victims. And that is exactly the type of prey that a hunter, a predator in the animal kingdom goes for. Staff at the old people's home where the two men were killed 
told police another chilling detail. They'd heard a surprising sound before the killer fled. One of the peculiarities of the death of the two Polish gentlemen was that when he'd killed one of them, when he'd stopped, he used a flannel to have a wash and an electric razor to have a shave. And we know this because one of the staff at the care home heard it and thought it was a bit strange. It was hard for New Scotland Yard investigators to comprehend the nature of a man who could kill so brutally and then calmly have a shave. He washes himself. Again, this is very much what an animal does. They've been in for the kill and it's an urge after that kind of attack, that kind of involvement, to clean oneself. And I think that's, that's partly what we're seeing. I personally have never heard of a serial killer who'd killed two people in one night, let alone in the same place. And this shows us, it's an insight into his state of mind because he needed to kill two, not just one, but two. Despite being mindful of creating panic, Scotland Yard knew they had to let the public know the danger that lurked among them. We're talking about a time when people were extremely frightened, and old people in particular were frightened because these murders weren't happening in some isolated place, a cottage or a long way away from everybody else. They were happening in the middle of old age people's homes on busy streets. So a lot of people were terrified and there was enormous pressure on the police to come up with some kind of an arrest. The media pressure was mounting for a fast result. There was a tremendous pressure on the senior investigating officer to get a, a successful result. As with many serial murderers, the press gave the killer a headline-grabbing name. We were going through a very hot summer and a heat wave. It was 29, 30 degrees. And so the press very quickly dubbed him the heat wave killer. But after the murder of the two Polish pensioners in Stockwell, that nickname changed. And the media were convinced because it had concentrated down into Stockwell, somebody came up with the phrase, the Stockwell Strangler. And it was such a natural headline that it stuck. Detective Chief Superintendent Ken Thompson was leading the murder hunt and realised the danger posed by the Stockwell Strangler. He also knew information that hadn't been released to the general public. Before killing his victims, he sodomised them. These were appalling crimes of wanton violence. Hundreds of officers from other operations at New Scotland Yard were now drafted in to help bring the killer to justice. So we knew we had maybe days or weeks to catch this guy before he killed somebody else. So that instills a tremendous amount of adrenaline and professional urgency to it. That's what we do. You know, detectives are supposed to catch bad guys and a serial killer is probably the ultimate bad guy. To allay public fear, there was a highly visible police presence on the streets. When you start reporting that kind of stuff, then people get even more scared. So, for the first time, we were now seeing in these housing estates uniformed police just wandering around reassuring terrified people. And at the same time, they were telling us that there were plainclothes detectives at night guarding old people's homes. Extra police have been drafted onto the beat to cover wide areas of London. This morning, police repeated their warning to elderly people to keep all doors and windows locked at night. It's all about protecting the public then, it still is now. We had a crazy killer out in South London who had to be caught. It was essential we caught this guy before he killed anybody else. With each new murder, there's more coverage from the media and more fear amongst the residents of South London. The focus on what police are doing to prevent further bloodshed is intense. There was an enormous amount of pressure on the police. We have to remember that people in that area were extremely frightened. I spent a lot of time down in Stockwell, and wherever you went, in shops or on the pavement, people were talking about this. And the more they talked about it, the greater the pressure on the police. Police hunting the killer know that they hold people's lives in their hands. 
it's a huge responsibility for those involved. Because you don't know when the suspect is going to strike again. And especially with a serial killer, that means someone's going to die. And the time pressure on it is, it can be enormous. It's a high stakes murder hunt. And the investigation is taking its toll on some officers. It comes to light that not only was he killing old people, but also sex assaulting them in the most dreadful way. I remember it started to cause some concern for some of the officers, some of the detectives who lived locally, who had old parents in the stop wall and Clapham and all around that area. They quite understandably started to get a bit worried about, you know, how's mum and dad? What can we do to protect them or to safeguard them more? He's a very desperate man and he needs help. It is obviously these, these offences, if they're committed by one person, are diabolical attacks and he's got to be found very, very quickly. Detective Chief Superintendent Ken Thompson was leading the hunt for the killer. He ordered his officers to go back over the details of the Stockwell Strangler's murderous idiosyncrasies as they built a portrait of the kind of person who might be capable of these horrendous crimes. Psychological profiling like this was still in its infancy in the 1980s. With Mrs. Cockett, he tore off her nightgown, but then folded it up nice and neatly. With some of the other victims, he put them back in bed and then put the blankets over them, rearranged the bed, put the hands across the chest to look as if the victim had actually died in, of natural causes in their sleep. Some of the victims, he pushed items of clothing down the throat, like a sock or a pair of underpants. But then what was even more interesting was that he would turn around any photographs of relatives in the room, and obviously these people had pictures of their loved ones. He'd turn those pictures around against the wall, as if he didn't want these people to see what he was up to. It was very hard for some detectives to understand the depraved and peculiar details that seemed to be the signature behaviours of the murderer. From a civilised perspective, we try to make sense of some of the seemingly bizarre details in the way that he carried out his crime. So we try, from our perspective, to understand this turning away of the photos as if it has some kind of significance, as if it possibly reflects some kind of sensitivity or something in his own background. I don't think that's true. We try to make sense of the way in which he tucks up his victims at the end from a very human, a very sophisticated understanding of his behaviour. Again, I think that ignores what these crimes actually are. They are animal attacks. And what he is doing is making sure that the coast is clear. Turning away the photos is akin to a lion in the jungle, making sure that, that he's not being observed. What we're dealing with is not a civilised human being, is not somebody that we can understand from our own frameworks, but rather we're dealing with somebody who is a primal predator operating in, in our world. Because the details of the murders are so grisly, police are cautious about releasing them to an already frightened community, although they published the photofit picture. Everybody knew that at the very beginning of this, the police were very reluctant to reveal the details of what he was actually doing to his victims. A team at New Scotland Yard continued to work on cross-checking the palm print evidence that they'd collected at the crime scene of Janet Cockett's murder with what they already had on file for other criminals. Well, in the 1980s, the forensics and the fingerprints department it was probably just at the start of when we were really getting going with computerised and digital technology. And I'm sure on this case, because it, we believe we had a serial killer, then it would have been expedited, but it would still have taken, I think, possibly weeks to go through all the files and match the finger and palm prints up. He left very few fingerprints, so he was fingerprint aware. And that's one of the indications that this guy might have done other things than murder, that he had some sort of history where not leaving fingerprints was, was helpful in not being arrested. But despite the enormous number of dedicated officers on the case and the huge publicity, police could not prevent another horrific and unnatural death. 
This time, the Stockwell Strangler changed one vital detail of his usual MO. He went north of the River Thames for his next kill. It was July 8th, just 10 days after the double homicide in Stockwell. 82-year-old William Carman lived alone in a low-rise block of flats in Islington, North London. Despite police warnings, his window was open. Whether or not he moved up to that part of London to throw us off the scent, we'll never know. But this was slightly different as well, in that for the first time, some cash was stolen. Several hundred pounds were stolen from Mr. Carmen's address. Again, the photographs were either face towards a wall or flat down. William Carmen's murder was a geographic anomaly. Just 10 days later, on the 20th of July, 1986, the killer's right back in his South London stomping ground. The sixth murder victim lived on the very same estate in Stockwell as the second victim, Janet Cockett. On the 20th of July, a Mr Downs was found and he too had been murdered. He'd been sexually assaulted. There were semen stains on the bed sheets, which were once again laid out over his body to look, make it look initially that he died of natural causes. He too was a very old man. He'd been found under the bed sheets naked uh, by his son. I remember going to the scene of the Downs murder. He was confined to bed, so it wasn't the most pristine of scenes. And there was a lot of staining on the floor. But what became obvious under the strong sort of scenes of crime uh, lights was the fact there was a, a large stain on the floor that turned out to be a mixture of blood and saliva with lip prints on it. The inference is that he was murdered in bed and then taken out of bed and at some point was, was face down on the floor. But the time the police got to the scene, he was back in bed with no blood obvious around his mouth and swabbing down his throat to stop any more blood coming out of his mouth and sort of neatly arranged and tidy him back in bed again. Since the second murder, the killer had left no further prints. Maybe he consciously cleaned up after himself. But at William Downs' murder, he slipped up again. At the scene where Mr Downs had murdered, the forensic examination of both the body and the scene would have been extremely intense, as a result of which we found more fingerprints. There was a palm print on the gate and another fingerprint in the window. Murder hunt detectives now have two sets of prints. And shortly after this, they had the breakthrough they'd been working towards. The prints at William Downs' murder scene not only match those found at Janet Cockett's, they also match ones they had on file. They belonged to a man called Kenneth Erskine. Now in this particular case, they had a, a fairly lucky break in a way, which was that Erskine had previously committed an offence against social security and fraud, and so there were palm prints on record. Kenneth Erskine was eventually identified as a result of the palm print that was found at Miss Cockett's house. That was compared and matched with the other palm prints that were, and fingerprints that were found subsequently. And then uh, after that, uh, it was a simple manhunt. Then we, we had our man. And it was just a question of finding him and arresting him. In less than three months, six pensioners had lost their lives in the most awful way imaginable. New Scotland Yard detectives could now put a name and a face to the killer, but could they catch him before he strikes again? Police quickly establish he's homeless with no known address. Detectives are still under immense pressure to put an end to the killings. We're professional detectives, we want to catch this person for the sake of everybody. So senior investigating officer has to take all the real pressure. I was a detective sergeant at the time. We felt that pressure too. Now Erskine had been identified, police dug into his background to gain clues that might lead to his capture. They uncovered an extremely troubled childhood. He had displayed violence at a very early age. He'd tried to stab a teacher. He tried to hang his brother twice. He supplied cannabis to his brother, which is why his mum and dad kicked him out of the house at around about 16. 
Once kicked out on the street, he became a petty criminal, which is why his fingerprints and palm prints became initially lodged at Scotland Yard. He had no home. He drifted from pillar to post, slept rough. He had no friends. What we see in Kenneth Erskine's background is his family cutting him off. Then we see essentially him being put into special establishments. Again, him being separated from mainstream society. And his response was to become something psychologically which was entirely separate. He became something psychologically which was unrecognisable to us, to normal human society. On the morning of the 23rd of July, 1986, 80-year-old pensioner Florence Tidzall was excited. She lived alone with her three cats in Fulham, South London. As a huge fan of the royal family, she couldn't wait to watch the marriage of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson, the Duke and Duchess of York, later that day. Even though she'd be watching the royal wedding at home on TV, she wanted to look her best to show respect to the young couple. In the morning, she went to the hairdressers. She lived in Fulham and loved cats. Because of the cats, she left the window open so the cats could come and go as they please. Florence Tisdall lived and died alone in this flat, a frail woman who could only walk with a frame she was strangled in bed. Her body was found by a caretaker who helped feed her cats. A window was always left open to let them in and out. Florence's murder was brutal and followed the same pattern as previous killings. She was found strangled again, laid out in bed with her arms neatly placed across her chest. She had been savagely sexually assaulted and she also had two broken ribs and severe chest bruising. Florence was the seventh murder victim in less than three months. But for responders called to the scene, the sordid details of her killing were still hard to comprehend. What kind of monster would murder and rape the elderly? I think by focusing on the elderly nature of many of his victims, we've missed the point about Kenneth Erskine. Actually, Kenneth Erskine is a predator. He's a creature, a wild creature, operating within our social world. Erskine was of no fixed address, which made him hard to find. And in their attempts to track him down, police called on more than 300 bedsits and squats all over London. But they had no luck. His homelessness made his capture much more difficult, but detectives received a vital bit of information. Throughout his killing spree, and even though he'd stolen around £3,000 from his break-ins, unemployed Kenneth Erskine had continued to sign on the dole. In those days, if you are on benefits, they would send you a gyro cheque, and you'd have to take the gyro cheque to the DSS office to cash it and to be interviewed about getting a job, and that sort of thing. It all happened so fast, really. Because we had identified Kenneth Erskine, we knew that he was cashing his uh, DSS gyro cheques, at the DSS office in Stockholm. We had spoken to the people at DSS and said, if Kenneth Erskine comes in, please phone us as soon as possible. And I was in the office when the phone rang, I happened to answer it. And there was a lady's voice saying, are you interested in Kenneth Erskine? I said, yes, where is he now? So the lady said, well, he's waiting for his DSS check. So I remember my colleague and I drove across Clapham Common when the end came to Kenneth Erskine's reign of terror, it was with more of a whimper than a bang. At a time of such high drama, the arrest in a way came as something of an anticlimax, because they were waiting outside the social security offices and when they arrested him, he went without struggle. His demeanor was very calm, he put up no resistance. It was almost like he was accepting that the game was up and it was his time to be arrested. I think Erskine's response to being caught, the, the surprising compliance from this aggressive predator, tells us exactly how divorced he is from the normal understanding of what's going on. For those involved in the manhunt and for a terrified community, the relief at the capture of Kenneth Erskine 
was palpable. There was a general atmosphere of euphoria, really. A lot of people had done an awful lot of hours. I guess they'd missed kids' birthdays, nights out with their partners for a long time, for several months. The public reaction to his arrest was very similar to that of the police officers involved in the investigation. Euphoria. I'm safe, my parents are safe, granddad and grandma are safe. Although police are certain that Erskine is the Stockwell Strangler, it becomes clear he's not mentally stable. With a mental age of only 11, there's no possibility of him making a coherent confession. The trial of one of Britain's worst serial killers begins at the Old Bailey on the 12th of January 1988, nearly 18 months after his capture. It's hard to equate the small, childlike 24-year-old in the dock with the savagery of his crimes. His behaviour in court is bizarre. He was laughing and giggling. He was masturbating in the dock. He did admit to breaking into all the premises, but said somebody else must have come along and killed and sexually assaulted the old people after he had left. Clearly, this wasn't believed by the jury, and he was convicted and. Uh, seven charges of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum sentence of 40 years. Erskine's trial at the Old Bailey took just 17 days to conclude and set a record. At the time, 40 years was the longest minimum term ever handed down in a British court. We didn't know all the details of Erskine's background, of course, until it got to the trial. And it was only then that the details of his violent childhood and all of that kind of stuff started to come out. But I think it's a fairly good indication of the general mood of the time that actually the judge sentenced to him to one of the longest sentences in British history. By giving him 40 years, we'll ensure that he will die in prison. The acts that Kenneth Erskine committed are unquestionably evil. Whether Kenneth Erskine was born evil is, is a more of an open question. Mad or just evil is a question many have pondered. In 2008, decades after his crimes, his sentence for murder was appealed on the grounds of his questionable mental state at the time of the killings. There was an appeal made by his defence team to say that, that he was guilty of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. And so he was moved from a prison to Broadmoor. Broadmoor Hospital for the Criminally Insane is perhaps the most famous of its type in the world. It has housed many of Britain's infamous murderers, like Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. Kenneth Erskine, the Stockwell Strangler, is one of its most notorious inmates. We see a lot of stuff about communities living in fear and people stalking the streets in Hollywood movies. But this was real. And for a lot of people, it was a time of real terror, fear that somebody might break through their window at night and attack them in bed and then murder them. This was real. And it was one of the most extraordinary times in history. of Kenneth Erskine, a lonely, friendless drifter, were committed many decades ago. In just three months in 1986, seven senior citizens were murdered in their beds. Hundreds of New Scotland Yard detectives were deployed to catch the killer. Eventually, they caught Erskine, and the streets of South London were freed from the reign of terror that he'd created.